Welcome to episode 156 of the Sports Geek Podcast. On this week's episode, I chat about the evolution of database marketing with Spencer Horner from the LA Galaxy. Welcome to the Sports Geek Podcast, the podcast built for sports digital and sports business professionals. And now, here's your host, who stopped his football career after one game with Mark Bosnick, Sean Callanan. Thanks, DJ Joel. Yes, uh, it was not a long and illustrious uh, football career. Um, I did play in a media game as part of the warm-up to the Asian Cup uh, in Australia. And uh, Mark Bosnich, a former Socceroo, and Craig Moore, a former captain and Socceroo, played in the game. And uh, I actually took over from Bozza, who's now a, a, a legend of the game and a legend on Australian football TV. Um, he was a Socceroos goalkeeper, but he did not want to stay in the goals. And I decided to go in the goals to replace him. And I practically almost broke my little finger. It's still not quite bending properly. So, But then again, I did look at Mark Bosnich's fingers and they were pointing in different directions. So... Thanks again for the opportunity to play with Bozza. But, yeah, my uh, football career was uh, short and sweet. Um, my name is Sean Callanan, and that's probably what I should have done at the start of the show. But uh, Sean Callanan from the Sports Geek Podcast. You're either listening to this on iTunes, your favourite podcast app, or you might be doing it at sportsgeekhq.com. You might go to the website every now and again. Um, as always, you can contact me, Sean, at sportsgeekhq. Um, what I did, I'm um, recording this post Seat Atlanta, uh, as I said in the previous episode, I'm also recording this intro, outro at the site of my, uh, my first seat at the JW Marriott here in LA. And just early this morning, I went and chatted with Spencer Horner, who was another attendee of multiple seats. Uh, he was also there in Atlanta. Uh, he is the senior manager for database marketing at the LA Galaxy. So I thought it'd be a good time to go back um, and talked to Spencer. I met, met him a couple of years ago, and obviously we've spoken previously with Aaron Labelli, who gets mentioned in this in this interview, um, around some of the things they've done from a database marketing point of view for the LA Galaxy to progress fans uh, through their database and sort of continually move escalate them up from a sing- single season ticket holder to multiple tickets. Um, so I th- caught up with Spencer Horner at StubHub Centre earlier today, and here's our chat. Very happy to be here in the uh, in the conference room underneath, effectively, uh, StubHub Centre here in Los Angeles, and happy to welcome Spencer Horner, Senior Manager of Database Marketing for the LA Galaxy. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Sean. Um, so, one, it's good to good to catch up with you. I think we were just reminiscing. Um, I came through here after catching up with Lisa Bregman and and did a bit of a tour, and I think it was 2012, which is when I first met you, and. Uh, Made the impression with the with my business card. Uh, did the did the business card trick and got the team right. Can you tell me what I what the card that I handed yeah, you? Yeah, it's funny story because I uh, used to live in Australia a long time ago and uh, in Adelaide specifically. And Sean, I think, has this thing where uh, he tapes basically his business card information on various trading cards. And I got one from the South Australia's own mighty Adelaide Crows. And um, I thought that was awesome because um, from living in Australia, the Crows were my favorite footy club. So a little bit of a connection there. So that <laughs> that made it easy to remember. And I mean, obviously, since then, I've, you know, we have a lot of common uh, connections through um, Animal Valley at AEG, the Seat Conference, and, um, you know, a lot of other interactions. But, and I don't, I don't normally run into uh, uh Crows fans. I mean, there's a lot of Crows fans out there, but I don't normally expect to be walking into a, <laughs> an organisation in L- in LA and say because most people look at the cards and I have used the trick and I've actually got new cards now that are, that I'm on the trading card. But that was my <laughs> that was my little hack for uh, the first seven years of Sports Geek. But yeah, most people c- would get the card and go, "What's this? Uh, you know, is this rugby? Is this Aussie rules?" And you're straight away going, "Oh, that's my Adelaide Crows." Yeah, exactly. So. Uh, takes takes a little bit through. Uh, when did you uh, you joined the Galaxy? Just a little bit before we met. Yeah. Um, and and take us through what your role is now. So yeah, I started uh, with the the Galaxy in 2012. Um, 
funny story about, I guess, getting into the sports industry because, um, as, uh, many people know, it can be a hard nut to crack on the entry level. Everybody's just really fighting to get in, especially here in the United States. And, uh, while I was in college, I worked for uh, a CRM consultant um, all the way through college and got some really good experience under my belt. And um, I think that was a really great launch pad for when um, you know I met Aaron at AEG and um, and them taking a chance on me, um, you know, very early in my career without any prior sports experience. So feel very uh, blessed, I guess, to be part of this team and part of this industry. Um, when it is, like I said, very difficult to get into. So yeah, I've been here since 2012 and uh, been in a very similar role, you know, the past five years, but. Um, but the yeah. landscape's changing so much. So, you know, the conversation that I had with Aaron where he talked about, so Aaron Lavalley, who's at AEG, uh, Galaxy and the Kings are uh, both under that same banner. And, and he sort of talked about that email workflow for, for when people come on board as a ticket, they buy a single ticket and then they go into a different path. That The, the landscape, and I've got, I've got slides, and if you go to um, chiefmartech.com, every year they release, here's all, the, here's all the tools in the marketing tech landscape. Seven years ago, it was 150. The, light, the latest infography has 5,000 like so, the landscape and the and the ability for for you to I guess dive in on the data and do different things that that's vast, vastly changing your time at the Galaxy, hasn't it? Definitely, yeah. When I when I started, um, they I mean I was replacing someone in my role, but it was still a very new role yep. for my club. And you'll see in other teams in our league and even in the United States, um, there's still a lot of people that don't have someone who's dedicated to to CRM and database marketing specifically. And um, so it was a role where I had to really build from the ground up in a lot of ways. It started primarily with email marketing, which is a very um, easy, I guess, channel to get into. Um, so take but, us through take us through that because you're right. Like yeah. the you know, and again, some of the conversations at Seed are always are always good in the and I spend a lot of time more in the CRM data track, is that everyone's on a different part of the journey yeah. and it's an ongoing journey no one i don't think anyone put up their hand and said we've got it right yeah, right the holy exactly. grail of marketing automation that from you know new customer to highest value customer there's always work to do to to, to improve that yeah. so early early on and you're right you know the email marketing or i'm sending out the emails and you're creating the audiences what's the what was the first couple of things that you had to first look at to, to, to get that started because you don't want to, you know, a lot of people go, okay, here's our whole list. We're sending out the same email to everybody. Exactly. Yeah. It was very much sort of a blast batch and blast operation at the beginning. And, um, focusing on segmentation was very important. Um, getting the, the right audience, even if it means a smaller segment of people and me having to have that conversation with, you know, business leaders at the club, saying if we do this segmented list, you're, it's going to do better and we're going to have to spend less resources to do it and uh, contact less people in order to achieve our objectives. Some of those, um, just because it was sort of new to our club, were, were difficult conversations, you know, especially with sponsorship and they wanted to, you know. They're attracted by that big number. Exactly. You know, they, you know Spencer, impressions, we, we, impressions, we, we, impressions. We know that you've got 100,000 people there or, or whatever. Please blast them, yep. right? And, you know. And it is a term that makes your skin crawl when they say, can you just send out an email blast? It's yeah. like, well, no, no. Um, you've got to be able to tell me who you want it to go to yeah. because I can't sell tyres to a 14-year-old because they don't have a car and, and it doesn't make sense. And, and those- as, as you guys know, um, saying no is not usually an acceptable answer. <laughs> you have to come up with a good alternative. And I think in a lot of ways we've moved in the right direction as far as segmentation goes where I'm, I don't get asked that question anymore of, Hey, send this to our newsletter list. Send a get dedicated blast to our, our our big list. They say, hey, can I be included in this? Or do you have a segment of people that would be right for this? For example, I just had a great conversation with one of one of my colleagues about um, we have a camps and clinics segment that we that we uh, send for information about soccer camps yeah. and clinics and and uh, tournaments. And they said, hey, we have this company who's really great. They're really geared towards families and children 
and parents, um, we'd like to include them in the segment. And, and it was a good conversation. That's a great idea. Yep. So I think the mentality has definitely changed um, with with the company, and probably it's probably a lot of other teams can probably say the same thing. But it, but you have to get those wins for them to to win that trust of saying, look, I'm going to send it to ten percent of that list, but I can get the right result. And so once you start having those wins of targeting the right people and getting the, the open rates and the clicks that they want, then you build build that trust, and that that's just that's just a thing that happens over time, doesn't it? Yep, absolutely. Um, and so. So take us through what I want to do is take us through, take us through some of the tools in the tech stack, you know, because I said there are five thousand different tools, and you know, a lot of them are getting added to the to the mix. Um, a lot of people, the people making a lot of money in marketing tech, the people make, selling the marketing tech tools. Um, what are some of the tools that you're using to send? You know, uh, what's your what's your uh, CM, uh, what's your CRM framework? Your email? How are you doing that kind of thing? You want to take us through what you're using? Yeah, so we're currently at this time we're in a pretty transitional position. Um, I think every, that's the thing. I think everybody yeah, is. Everybody's <laughs> always changing. It's never right, and there's a lot of actually really interesting stories about how we have either decided to change or we've had to change through no decision of our own. Yeah. Um, especially being part of a, a corporate entity like AEG, but. Currently, right now, um, technology-wise, uh, CRM, we're using a sort of a customized platform that's built inside of um, our ticketing system, Outbox, and, yep. which is interesting because um, Outbox was sort of the primary platform that Access.com used um, as their backend for a ticketing system. Yep. And the idea was that we built this contact management system within it. And um, our sales reps would have one-stop shop for both processing tickets and logging their activities. And then the funny story to that is that AEG um, made a, a deal with Veritix, if you've heard of that platform, and basically said, well, LA Galaxy, LA Kings, everybody, you have to move all of your ticketing over to Veritix. Yeah. So currently we have the CRM system that's sort of housed in a ticketing system that we don't use anymore. So we're looking at a lot of different vendors. Um, on the corporate level, we have a deal with um, Core and uh, to use the Microsoft Dynamics yep. um, platform. So we're we're looking to s- possibly switch to that, but there's still a lot of uh, things that we need to answer. But I think, you know, at, it sounded like a good plan at the time, but sometimes circumstances change and – yeah. Well, and, so. and it is and it is very tough that uh, to, to to build something bespoke these days, which is why more people are moving towards a solution that sits on top of Dynamics. Yeah. So, are you still so to get to do the segmentation that kind of thing? Are you diving as far d- deep as writing SQL and things like that, or a you, you know how do you go about doing it? Yeah. So, um, sort of to kind of cover our other main. Um, platform for marketing automation right now. We use Adobe Campaign. Okay. Yep. Um, the artist formerly known as Neil Lane. Um, and then in a lot of ways, you know, we're we are considering other tools as well, and we might will we're probably likely making a transition soon. But um, that's our primary uh, marketing automation tool. And on the segmentation side, um, the method that I've used is, you know, the biggest segment of our data comes from our ticketing system. So typically. Yep. I'll pull queries from our ticketing system, whether it's been Outbox or now Veritix, where I'll pull a lot of our segments for whether it's email marketing or our digital advertising and social marketing. Um, I'll pull it from that primarily. Um, and uh, But then we have a lot of other data sources, whether it's from sweepstakes or from um, our team ambassadors doing um, – street team type marketing where they're uh, capturing data through iPads or data cards. We have to sort of aggregate that um, and sort of put them into segments. And kind of the biggest challenge with that right now is we don't really have a central data warehouse that we can put all these data sources into. I'm, I'm gathering it from five or six different sources and sort of pulling it together in a list in Excel and then uploading it either to our CRM system or our marketing automation system, we're sending it to our digital advertising agency, which in itself is probably not a great idea, you know, sending a CSV of, of data to, to somebody. And we, we've have a signed agreement where 
hopefully we have our our data security yep. insured, but still not not ideal. So I think us developing this data warehouse, and we're sort of teaming together with the LA Kings and AG Sports to pull together our resources and to have that. So. And that's one of the advantages. As much as you know, sometimes changes are forced upon you being in a larger group. The the advantages are you've also got these shared resources of AAG uh, and you know uh, f- other clubs under the banner, and the fact that you know access to people like Aaron that that uh, make your job easier. But yeah, that that situation of getting all this data and it's coming into different places and. I'm still using Excel and that kind of thing is still pretty prevalent um, for, for most people because you've that 360 degree view is that ideal. I want every bit of data hitting it and coming back and tagging or that they've read emails and they've done something on social and that they've visited the website. That is the ideal sort of pinnacle where you're, where you're trying to go. So if that's your uh, tech stack, you know, uh, with Adobe sort of running all the marketing automation, do you want to take us through um, – so uh, the majority of your work, is it mainly in uh, focused on ticket sales, sort of s- discussing ticket sales, season ticket and, and groups, as well as sponsorship partnership work? Is that sort of the, the areas of your work? Yeah, so a primary – a very large objective of what um, my – department does is is focused on ticket sales yeah. um the la galaxy you know is for and has been for years i think the the top of of mls as far as team performance goes and even you know with how we've done business wise we've done very well with that being said um we still you know we still have to sell tickets you know we we're still in a position where you know, we, we can get a sellout crowd on a regular basis. We, we are in a position, but we have to do the work in order to do it. Um, and so ticket sales, that makes ticket sales a big part of, of the objectives of our campaigns. And I think there's, there's not very many clubs who don't have that objective unless you're, unless you got Steph Curry suiting up for your team. Yeah. yeah. You know, usually that's, that's, a pro, uh, an objective for you. So it's very much, yeah, it is very much. I've said it before. It's all about the cheeks and the seats. And what I did like about the conversation um, in the, in the data track of, of the CRM at seat was that there was such, there was a lot of people talking about email and it's not, it's not as sexy as, you know, uh, building out a chat bot or, or, you know, trying out new forms of social, but it's still a consistent driver for revenue. Like, because, you know, if you can get your segments right and get the right people into your, into your database, it, it drives tickets. Um, so um, ha- what's the mix of – so it, when we had a – lucky enough to have Aaron talk to um, uh, the A-League clubs. So the A-League is, the, is effectively the equivalent of the MLS in, in Australia and Australia has a real strong membership culture. So people become a member as opposed to a season ticket holder. And there's a lot of effort in the membership marketing. What's the mix at, at StubHub? How many from a member point of view to to a ticketed sort of uh, mix? So as far as membership goes, the past two or three years, we've really strived to move ourselves to more of a membership model. Yep. We we call them season t- ticket members yep. as opposed to season ticket holders. If if any of our new employees say season ticket holders, we we correct them uh, right it, away because it, it has an identity tie to it. Yeah. Like you feel like part of a club yep. rather than a transactional. I think that's it is just a mindset of yeah. of saying, "Oh, you're a member of our club." Yeah, and, and so it, that that focus, how's that gone? I, yeah, I think it's gone well, um, and sort of the, some of the things that we're doing to sort of at least convince our our members that they're moving more towards a membership model is giving them some really exclusive experiences that they wouldn't get otherwise. Um, It's more than just a discount on a ticket for an entire year. We've done things like we've split them up and we've called them neighborhoods. We've, We've split the, the stadium into sections where sort of, you know, eighths where each of our service executives sort of supervises yep. a section and they do special neighborhood events where, you know, one service exec before a game will invite just his neighborhood to to a barbecue prior to the game and maybe okay. a, a player will appear or maybe we'll have an engagement with our club president at the stadium club after the game or an exclusive 
photo on the pitch or an autograph session, um, exclusive watch parties, things like that, that we've tried to make our members feel like they're part of the club, that they're getting something that nobody else is getting. And, 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 and you, and you helping them to also identify themselves and put their hand up to say, I'm a member, whether it be with specific merch for, to say, I'm a member, I'm a proud member yeah. since. What are yep. the kind of things you're doing there? So, yeah, from a, a merchandise standpoint, we usually have a scarf in, in the soccer world is – is a common thing. Last year, is it we, work in LA? Is it too hot? Like, <laughs> I mean, I, I'm quite happy wearing my Collingwood scarf at the MCG in the middle yeah, of winter. I thought about that. I'm like, why do would people even want to wear scarves? And I mean, the really nice knit scarves are pretty thick, but they still wear them in a soccer game. And yeah. we sort of, in a lot of ways, to also to cut costs, we have sort of these kind of more lighter polyester scarves. I'm like, those are sort of more LA friendly, but. I mean, in the soccer culture, it's scars are still a big part of it. And even this last year, we, um, as a reward for renewing their membership early, we had um, an Adidas hooded sweatshirt yep. with that said LA Galaxy season ticket member on and then an Adidas patch on it as well. And um, so things like that that we try to help them identify themselves. And then a big part of uh, soccer – in probably most parts of the world is having a, a supporters club yep. inside of a, a season ticket membership. So we have uh, those supporters clubs that they, they create their own, their own merchandise, their own identity as well. They have their own logos, they have their own events and um, they're the ones, you know, sort of at the center of the stadium singing and cheering with the and, flags. And, and they're the ones that become ambassadors for, for the LA galaxy. Yes. They're the ones that, that convert people, um, you know, you would have seen the same living in Adelaide. That would have, everyone would have said, "Who do you now barrack for?" You know, uh, and I think that's you know, from a membership point of view, um, I, I liken the what the AFL has done uh, and the NRL is following suit in in Australia is it gets to guilt level in that when you get to that top level fan and you know you become a member of the club when they see someone they go, "Oh, do you follow the Galaxy?" The second question is, "Are you a member?" And so they start doing the marketing for you. Yeah. Um, and so it's a really good culture fit to, uh, to, be, to be doing that. Yep. And I think with, in the United States where soccer is still very much a growing sport, um, that word of mouth definitely helps us a lot. And, and I think the other biggest asset we have is just getting people into our stadium. There's people who might never have been to a soccer game before in their life, but if – you know, they come to Stub Up Center with a packed crowd with, you know, I think soccer crowds are more are louder than any other crowd in, in American sports and more coordinated as well. Yep. It's it's very it's a very unique experience. And I think that's how a lot of people get hooked. Yep. Is when they come and see it for themselves in person. Yeah, well we uh we came to a game, uh uh LAF uh, sorry, uh, LA Galaxy game with Steven Gerrard played. I think it was his first game. Yeah came here with Rob Skillachotti and had an absolute, absolute ball. And I will find – I will add this for the sounds of the game, but when the uh, uh, when your ground announcer, someone scores – and the and the whole crowd goes uh, uh, thank you, and then and then and then and then the whole and and then they respond you're welcome. Yes, like <laughs> it's it's just it's, it's awesome and you know and I think there was four goals scored and so we were we were all set for it next time and and they it's cheer just, they cheer the player they say the yeah, player's name yeah. and then the crowd responds uh, yeah and then the PA announcer says thank you and you're welcome yeah. yeah yeah the whole crowd so I mean and it is and it is something that is. It is unique to football. Yeah. You know, it is, it's the same that's happening in, you know, you're trying to get that European feel of what it's like to be at a game. It's the same thing that happens at active support, happens in, in Australia. And and it is a different experience. I don't know if you uh, were at the eSports panel uh, yes, that Charlie was, was on. Um, I thought some of that stuff uh, was fascinating that he was talking about the data side of gaming and FIFA and some of the you know the relationship you guys now have with EA Sports around the association of if someone picks Galaxy as their team in FIFA, they become more highly engaged, spend more money, buy more tickets. Um, have you been blown away by some of that data and some of the insights that are coming out of FIFA? Yeah, I've I've only gotten really a really quick batch of that data. Um, we're getting to the point where. Um, our relationship with MLS is they give us, it's a very, it's a good data wise. It's a very strong relationship. In my opinion, they 
will share with us everyone who's subscribed from the league level, yep. everyone who's said that their favorite team is our team, and then any any game that they promote um, through their promotion company, Soccer United Marketing, um, in our market, they'll also give us the buyer data to that. So it's a very wealth, a very uh, great resource um, for additional lead data. Um, and how EA Sports, their partnership with EA Sports folds into that is very soon um, that engagement data with our club is going to be part of that daily feed that we will get access to. And I think, yeah, what a lot of things that they discussed in that session, which was one of my favorite sessions, um, one for, probably because we were discussing something that was brand new yeah. in, the, in in our market, but also um, I'm secretly, um, just the night before I watched I was born in the hotel and I watched the Street Fighter V Evo tournament in Los Angeles and Mandalay Bay was packed and I watched it for like two hours. I don't know what happened to me, but it was very engaging. <laughs> but um So you so we'll get into it, we'll park yeah. that, we'll get back to esports. Yeah, we can so talk about right. esports, but as far as that relationship with um with uh with EA Sports, I think that data is gonna be an important way for us to reach out to a segment of people, especially in our country who engage with soccer for with with EA Sports with the FIFA the FIFA game in particular yeah. because it's an interesting conversation when you interview even uh, an NFL player an NBA player and ask them you know their get to know you page what's your favorite video game yeah. they'll a lot of times they'll say FIFA 17 yeah. and a lot of these other people that never watch maybe never watch soccer on TV or in person they love FIFA yep. and they'll, there's a lot of people who are engaging with the logos, the sponsor, the Jersey sponsor, the, and the players of our club, um, in this game. And, and I have, I actually talked to a few people who have said, Oh, I start, I got into soccer playing FIFA. So I think it's a good, it'll be a good resource for us to try and market to those people in a unique way to try and say, Hey, it's great in real life as well. Yeah, and and that's the that's the thing. Some of the some of the things that came out of that panel, and you know, Charlie was coming at it more from hey, here's the data and how the league are leveraging yeah. it, and so it was like, how can you you know you're going to get new fans that are going to realize, oh, this this team is just down the road, yeah. or I can I can drive an hour and I'll be, I can go to a game live, um, and so how can they tie the enjoyment that they're having playing FIFA to you know, an MLS game. And one of the things uh, that Charlie said that they've done with a couple of teams and will do more was the when a player scores a goal, uh, rather than put the, 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 the true vision on the screen, they'll show the celebration in FIFA form, you know, in yeah. FIFA form in the computer to sort of to make that connection for fans in stadium to yeah. say, oh, yeah, I've seen that celebration. That's that's the same thing or see, or see how lifelike it is if the player is doing the same same sort of uh, action and to start tying the fun that they're having with, with the game with the actual real game. And it's going to be a terrific source for new fans. Yeah, I, it's definitely exciting. Um, and the fact that the league can broker a partnership like that um, – a mutually beneficial partnership that involves obviously our rosters, our jerseys, some of our stadiums and to get something like that, uh, you know, fan data from that resource, I think is a brilliant idea. So I'm looking forward to how we can, we can utilize that information. And it, and it is becoming a new broadcast platform effectively, you know, in the, in the audiences that are at there. Um, so, you know, there's a talk of a, of a few teams doing kit reveals Exclusively on like first their first reveal on FIFA, yeah. because that's where their most highly engaged fans are. Then they'll share it, and then you share it on other platforms. You know, I don't know. You know, four or five years ago, if you went to someone and you know, when we first met, oh, we're going to release the kit on a game, because yeah. you would traditionally go, oh, we've got to do it on TV, or yeah. or we've got to do it on social exclusively. But yeah. to to have a have a game being so embedded uh, into into the into the the game itself, but also have that global reach is a really fascinating way. But I wanted to tap into your passion for uh, for esports. Are you a, are you a, a gamer yourself, or are you just following along and interested from a sports business point of view, or a mash <laughs> or a mashup of both? A little bit of a mashup of both. I think growing up, I grew up in Idaho, which um, in a sort of a country college town. So honestly, there wasn't a lot to do. A lot of the people that lived around me were farmers and 
that wasn't really my game. So <laughs> I played a lot of video games, let's just say, growing up and a little bit after college. And uh, long story short, I got married. I ran out of time um, and money because it's an expensive uh, thing to be into. But I still have some passion for those games. And um, and it's just been interesting to see how, how esports has grown um, globally and, and in our country as well for – for me, like I said, to see a Street Fighter Five um, tournament air live on ESPN two, I mean, that's a cable wise, that's a national broadcast. Yep. And I've seen, uh, I'll log into my ESPN three app and I'll see a league, a League of Legends tournament on it, almost you know on a weekly basis. I'll see something on there. And um, so, so it's just so it's just getting that mainstream, starting getting that mainstream yes. cred. You're starting get you're getting the buzz that a lot more more and more pro teams are, yeah. you know, like the Crows uh, recently purchased Legacy. Uh, in my you know my chat with and because it's an audience audience extension play, and access to more data from yep. from your point of view. So it, yeah. it's a natural extension in that space. Yeah, exactly. And AG itself as well. I think I don't know if they if they are majority owners if they own just. A portion, but just purchased um, Immortals, yep. which is also, uh, from my knowledge, is a pretty big esports team here in the United States. And um, and they, I think the purpose of that acquisition wasn't just on the team side, but because this this team hosts a lot of tournaments in in the United States, and we just in LA alone, we have Staples Center to utilize, yep. Microsoft Theater, um, my uh, club what is it called now? The Novo yep. sort of a smaller club in addition to a bunch of other smaller venues that would be great venues for these types of uh, and the, events. Yeah, and that's the thing that, uh, you know, the, the, the learning hurdles for people who don't understand esports first is that it, the, the level of competition and, and the fervor by which the fans are following it. And the second one is that they do turn up in big numbers to stadiums to watch these games. Yeah, I don't remember which tournament it was specifically, but I think last year, we had one of the major League of Legends tournaments yeah, here at Staples Center. Yeah, that was that was that was their grand, effectively their grand final, the World Championship, yeah, and it sold out Staples Center. I think two days in a row. Yep, and uh, and forty six million people watched online. Yeah, and <laughs> when I went around because I was like, oh, I didn't know this was happening at Staples Center. I'm probably not going to get a, a comp for it, yeah. and no, I can't even buy my own ticket for it. It's sold out. Like I wanted to see it just because I was mostly curious, and I went around the office and said. Hey guys, did you realize that our Staples Center and our AEG, our primary AEG vendor sold out a video game tournament? And I showed them like the link to the page and everything. And p- people people in our office just had no idea that it was like this. And I tried to have a conversation with our our one of our venue managers as well as like, hey, we should get into this. Like, there's some real opportunities here. It might not be some of these bigger tournaments, but. Um, I mean, we do a lot of different things in our venue, whether it's in our uh, tennis stadium, the sort of a smaller stadium. We do boxing matches. We've done we've done bull riding there. I'm like, yeah. if the weather is nice and we can get the bandwidth, like we could do an esports tournament in one of these smaller venues on our campus. And, you know, there's just such a good opportunity. And even I think it's beneficial to start creating those relationships early on, sort of a, a low point of entry because well, it, it, there's a – really good potential that they could blow up and oh, ever, a, and it'll be a great investment, right? There's a ma- there's massive potential for that. I mean, what a few of the conversations I did have with with the IT and tech guys at SEAT was make sure you've got enough bandwidth because if you want to host an eSports to- yeah. tournament, that's one thing that they – true and, you know, and a few if, – if, if their rig is skipping a frame, they yeah. will freak out yeah. at you. <laughs> exactly. Um, back, back, to, uh, back to LA Galaxy, I want to just sort of – Take me through back to that ticket sales focus. Was there a particular campaign uh, that you've done recently that that one helped drive ticket sales? Which again, it's all about the cheeks and the seats. But where you were able to leverage other properties to potentially get new fans, which is always important. Like you always want to get new and fresh, fresh data into yeah, your system. Yeah, there, there's a yearly campaign that I think we've been doing for at least the last three or four years. Called we call it the Summer of Soccer campaign. But every summer. Um, here in LA, there's usually an opportunity to either have the Galaxy play against one of these European powerhouses. I think a couple years ago it was Barcelona. Yep. Before that, we hosted Real Madrid here at StubHub Center to a sold-out crowd. And we have those connections where we can 
either play one of those teams or have exclusive access to ticket inventory from one of to these preseason European friendlies that are happening in, here in L.A. For example, this year we played Manchester United here at Step Up Center, um, and then we also um, supported Manchester City against Real Madrid at the Coliseum, which is occurring uh, this next week. So, so, so how do you leverage those big assets and you know attractive games for for the LA market? That yeah, go, I want to so, see Man U or I want to see you know Man City Real. Yeah, so part of this summer of soccer campaign um, that we do every year, and for this year is we will bundle um, one of these events with these huge European clubs with uh, two or three Galaxy games, and we'll even say, hey, if you buy by this certain time. We'll even throw in an additional Galaxy game, maybe a Wednesday game that we maybe need to to fill out a little bit more um, to really give them some incentive, like, hey, this is a great value, and to really try to tap into that segment of soccer fans here in the United States that aren't into MLS yet. There's still a, a group of those people that are, you know, either from that country or 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 into the Premier League or the Bundesliga yeah, and, and- because of the quality of, of play as it's perceived. And like I said, our biggest asset is getting people in our stadium. And it's, I think, a, it's the live experience. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you know, because uh, it is the case that if you're not at the physical location of where the top end talent are, and in, in this case, you know, the Europe leagues, you can sort of have that, I'm a football snob and I only want to watch the best. Yeah. But if you actually still want to have the feeling of being at a live game, yeah. you you know, you can only go to the games you can actually physically get to. Yeah. and. You know that that converting those types of fans, or or just the pure end of fans. I'm just a fan of sport and live sport. Consuming yeah. it in that way is is the right way, and you're sort of selling the experience. It's it's still it's still vital. Yeah, and I think with this campaign in particular, the summer soccer campaign. You know, creatively, we tried to pair our biggest stars. You know, Giovanni dos Santos, who's a very well known star in the LA you know Latino community. Um, plays for the Mexican national team. We paired him with whether it was Paul Pogba or Sergio Aguero, um, Ronaldo, some of these other players saying, like, check out all these stars. And we really, I think, for the first time, did a very strong multi channel approach to this yep. campaign. You know, our bread and butter is, like I said, usually email marketing and so what else so what else you did other than so email marketing to yeah. your to your prospects, you probably sent a different offer or something to your to your season ticket members. Yep. Not this because they're not season ticket holders. Your season ticket members got a special offer to be to, to get to these games. And then what did you do outside of email? So yeah, like I said, our, our bread and butter is usually uh, email marketing and also um, sales calls. So yep. we we loaded a lot of um, who we thought had good potential for this package um, in our CRM system and pass it to our sales team. So we used sort of a very similar segment for all the channels, and that segment for this campaign in particular consisted of, one, people who've been to our games is usually great candidates to upgrade to a larger package, a yep. three- or four-game package. Yep. And then, But then we have access from these past European games that we have, and like I said, we have access to the data from MLS where they've hosted – Gold Cup and Mexican national team games and a number of other friendlies in our market where, you know, those people aren't in our system, but they're soccer fans. They're great candidates for this this campaign and also, um, you know, other sweepstakes. And when we announce these games, it's a great opportunity to capture additional data from these other fans because we'll say we'll do a sweepstakes or we'll do early access, pre-sale access to these tickets. Just give us your email address and a phone number. And then, boom, we have a great lead for this when they don't win the sweepstakes or yep. when the pre-sale gets sent out. So that's sort of the segment. And then some of the other channels, aside from CRM and, and email marketing, is we we did some really targeted audiences from uh, a uh, digital advertising yep. um, standpoint. And um, is that uh, – were you doing AdWords, Facebook, yeah. Twitter? Was it what a particular – Yeah, I, I helped with the segmentation and another group sort of does the management of yep. those campaigns. But I know we are – I attach tracking codes to each of the links. And our Google AdWords campaign I think was the most successful um, with that example. Um, the Facebook – we did a, a lot of Facebook marketing. And obviously the, Facebook has its advantages with lookalike audiences and – saying this is my segment of people. Yep. I want to find people who look like them. And um, and then double click, I think our agency does through that. So you're surfing, you know, Fox Soccer or 
some other random website. And I was obviously because I'm on a website all day. So I'm just getting inundated with summer of soccer ads on my yeah. personal computer. So I know it's working. Yeah. Right. So um, that was another major channel. We did a big um, direct mail piece for this as well, um, which I think still might be sort of an underrated channel for a lot of people. It might not work in every market, but yeah. we do. Every time we run a mailing campaign, I do a match back um, analysis to sort of attribute you know, the sales that did occur and I can match back, you know, sometimes five or six times my investment, um, to these mailer campaigns. It's, and it, it's hard to measure cause you don't know if they're like, Oh, I got a piece of mail. I'm going to go to the website right now. But I think it's a strong influencer. Oh, completely. I mean, yeah, we just need someone to, to develop an envelope so we can that has open rate tracking. So, but you, you know, a signal back to your a signal. Maybe <laughs> someone embed an RFID that once the glue is unsealed, it sends <laughs> us a message. Um, but you know, but the open rates for mail, yeah. if they're not bills yeah. are really high. Yeah. Exactly. And, and so you at least know that if you've got the, you know, if you've got your data, right, yeah. like, and you're not wasting it. And so you're not just sending it to everyone. If you're just sending it to a really smart segment, you will, you will open it. Yeah. Um, and, that's the key thing. Um, so I wanted to just before we before we wrap up, I wanted to get some of your key takeaways recently. We're in Atlanta for uh, for seat. Um, other than the other than the eSports panel, which we both loved with uh, Charlie and, and and Tom and the guys there, um, what was yeah, what were some of your key takeaways? Um, yeah, some of the sessions I enjoyed, there was a very interesting session about. Um, the ticketing landscape that was, <laughs> first of all, I mean, a lot of was, war, a lot of war stories. I would yes, assume to start yes, with. Yes, the yeah. title was was ticketing wars, a fight to the death. I'm like, oh, that's intense. <laughs> and they had, I think they had someone from Pacquiao on there. Yep. They had someone from SeatGeek. They had, uh, you know, all these different people. I'm like, my God, this could get interesting. And they all played nice, but um, you know, you see some of these secondary markets like SeatGeek and StubHub, which are you know, becoming primary ticket vendors for some of these teams. And, yep. um, I, I would like, I didn't have time to ask, but I was like, how is that going? Yep. You know, it's sort of flipping the script with that, but then just, you know, preventing fraud and also finding ways from my standpoint for what I do of capturing more people's information and preferences, um, on the purchase level. Cause you know, the, a lot of the, pr- the problem is, is that one person will buy a ticket for five people. I don't know person two through five is and um learning who those people are whether it's through transferring their tickets digitally emailing them yes there was a lot there was a lot of conversation and we got to use the uh at ballpark mlb Mm -hmm. solution where you know you just get the ticket and then you can forward it on and the the fact that you're forwarding it on means you're getting the data from that person um i think that uh, that was one of the good takeaways there were obviously a lot of people in the tech side of how Wi-Fi can capture those other people, yeah. um, and and those kind of things, and I sort of caught up with Josh uh, previously on Famous Fan, where you, the fans that get caught on the jumbotron can then go to a site and and screen cap them being on the jumbotron. So it's another way to you to get data. Yeah. And he's had some really good results in the in in the football space to see how many people actually go on. Um, the other one was, and it uh, 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 escapes me. Oh, it was. Were you in the um, the tradable bits one with uh, talking about music festivals and what no, they do for I, data? I, I didn't attend that one. So no. the one takeaway that Chris Freet uh, doubled down and said, "Did everyone write this down?" A lot of a lot of apps or sweepstakes and those kind of things are turning on like Facebook login, which is great because you get the Facebook data and you stake it in their interest graph. Yeah, and you get their handle, but you get their interest graph and what they like and those kind of things. Uh, what they do at music festivals a lot, they also allow Spotify login. And allow people to log in and use Spotify as a way to fill out their profile, and you end up with a completely different data set and interest yeah. set of well, this is the this is the taste and that that kind of thing, and especially if you're going for and I think this is what excited uh, you know Chris Chris Freet being in the college scene, you know it's a they they know that their audience is uh, are Spotify users, so allowing them making it easy, I'll just log in with Spotify yeah. um, as another piece of piece of data because you're getting a different profile of your fan by finding out what they're what they're listening to yeah and i think yeah aside along with that there was 
there was a good session, um, I think, where a lot of the NFL teams presented about um, about venue apps and team apps, and that's yep. been an objective of uh, of our digital department um, for years. And I think we're getting close to to possibly um, um, developing one. And and I think from a data standpoint, you know, just like you said, with gathering preferences through social login, yep. Spotify login, um, get having an app that's capturing all sorts of engagement data and having that fed back to our data warehouse, I think is going to be a good advantage, you know, and, and once, once, you know, that project is developed and completed, hopefully, you know, we can get stuff like what merchandise they've bought, what food stands do they go to, um, how we can sort of, especially on the membership side, how we can can give them special experiences that, you know, they don't know how we know what they know, but, (laughs) But we it find is, out. <laughs> it, it is a bit that way. But, I mean, I think the big advantage, you know, in the app space is uh, how it do, the app, and they, they're they doing it now, how it can change when you're in stadium, but how it also can, you know, it is the personalization aspect. And so if you remember, your app is slightly different and it's, you know, and it, and it does make you feel like a member in the same way that you're wearing your scarf that your app says, oh, welcome again, Spencer, looking forward to the game, here's your ticket all of those kind of things so it, that they feel like it's been built for them. And I think that's the next – That's the, you know, was, there was a lot of discussions on that personalization, both of the yeah. advertising and, and the content delivery. Yeah. I think that's what the next two or three years are going to yeah. hold. Yeah. Um, the la- the uh, One other thing I'd say about uh, the SEAT conference as a whole is it's one that I would pr- I'd personally recommend and the sessions are great, um, but in my opinion the networking is the biggest asset. Um and I was talking to to someone else there, and, and I said, if if I didn't go to this conference, I wouldn't I wouldn't know anybody outside of my company that does what I do. Yeah. And for people that do what I do, we we can typically be sometimes a one man army. Um, maybe this wizard in the corner of the office that nobody knows exactly what the CRM and database person is actually doing, but we know that he's helping somehow. Um, so to meet sort of other fellow nerdy wizards as myself and talk shop has been a great advantage for me. There's people that, you know, I have friendships with now, um, through this conference. And, you know, if, if there's, if there's people that have thought about attending, I definitely recommend it from, from a networking standpoint. Um, and, and just when we have opportunities to have round tables and discuss everybody, everyone's different challenges, you know, you'll know that, you know, a lot of times I look to myself and I'm like, man, I really need to get my stuff together. Yep. Um, and then you go to those conferences and you say, oh, that person really has their stuff together. Oh, the, that person, I'm in a lot better shape than that person. You realize everyone's sort of at a different level. And when it comes to especially the technology side of database marketing, um, it's it can be a slow process that is going to be a continual process to get your integrations right, to get the data moving the way it should and to, and to act on it um, in a, in an automated and, and thoughtful way. So having those conversations at seat, I think to me are, are a very valuable asset. Yeah, completely. Cause it is, you are, you do understand and effectively benchmark where you're at and discuss the same problems. Cause everyone's having the same problems and how they go about tackling and solving them. And so you can, in, it, it is in those networking conversations, whether they're happening in a hallway at lunchtime or at 3am in the morning, right? You're, you're, you are having those that you can implement you know, th- tomorrow, you know, as soon as, soon as you're back. Is there any, uh, how do you decompress all, all the, all the takeaways from seat is, do you have a process? Do you, are you going to spend the weekend looking over your business cards, connect with people? Did you take a lot of notes? Is it, um, how do you try to at least capture? Do you, do you have to write a report to say, this is what I learned? I, I usually try to write a report to, to, um, the exact, to, my supervisor to yep. sort of one kind of anim- I guess illustrate the value of the conference, but also to let them know that we have some good ideas. But you know, this time I didn't. We had a. I flew home and we had a game. Yep. Like two, three hours after I got off the airplane, so I haven't had a ton of time to decompress. But typically after the conference, yeah, I'll take my stack of business cards that I gathered. Maybe do some LinkedIn's. Maybe reach out with an email if I had a really great conversation with somebody. Um, take that notes and maybe do, you know, 
a one page bulleted summary that I can send to um, some executives in, in the club where you can say, Hey, here's some great ideas that I got from this conference. One, it's not a waste of everybody's money, but yeah. two, you know, we can, there's a few things here that we can implement and get some quick wins on. There's also a few things that are going to take a few months or years, but there are actionable ideas here that we can we can work with. Can so. you can you do uh, can you do the uh, one I thought one of the additions I thought were really good with with the visu- visual representations of the panel sessions where they had an artist there sort of building yeah. out those. I don't know if you saw me tweet that out, but I was like, I wonder how much this guy costs because I maybe next time we have a a club staff meeting we can get one of these guys over here. That was really cool. To see them, you know, with the drawings and yeah. So there's it. a few that were taken <laughs> snaps of the, you know, the visual representation of the, of the panel and it helps you pit, put it together. Um, a friend of mine, Link Azalee, teaches it, and uh, I might actually take her take her up and and uh, pick her brain on how to do it because yeah. it is a really good way to take notes. Yeah. Um, I've tried it. Uh, I've, I'm halfway through doing mine, my seat recap. For some reason, there's lots of uh, pictures of beer uh, <laughs> across across the page. But uh, I sort of tried to recap and do bullet points around all yeah. the conversations so I can go back on, oh, yeah, that's right. I had that conversation with Spencer and this is what my trip was. So there is different ways, but, yeah, you do need to take it, you know, it's half an hour or an hour just to jot down all the things yeah. and because it sort of helps it lock it in a little bit. Yeah, part of the – I think part of the – maybe the problems with conferences like that is you get all these ideas and a lot of them are very macro level ideas and you have to be real with yourself and be like, I'm not going to do this this year. I can move in that direction. And a lot of times people are in these panels are giving you their very best case scenario, maybe a little bit exaggerated versions of what they're doing. And so you have to realize, you know, within the scope of what your business is doing now, um, what you're able to do, in the short term and what you can move towards in the long term. So we'll wrap up. I just checked the Twitter feed. Bass did ask a question that I think we've covered. He was asking what was your biggest what your biggest success story from a B2C point of view with data as the starting point and how do you leverage them um, from a B2B point of view. But I think, you know, B2C, we've talked about what yeah. you're doing from a from a ticketing point of view and we've also talked the, the B2B piece from the yeah. sponsorship point of view. So I think we've covered all the uh, all the Twitter questions. Where can people find you on the internet to say that, you've, that they've listened? Okay, so I think my Twitter is at Spencer Horner. Um, jumped on that handle good. Um, and then I'm on LinkedIn, LinkedIn too if anyone wants to hit me up there. But um, I'm relatively active on Twitter. I... I don't know if our digital team, I don't know if they think my Twitter game is very, very good, but um, I try and I, uh, you'll see also that I'm a big Utah Jazz fan. So if you follow me on Twitter, you might subject yourself to too much Utah Jazz information. It's all right. You've but, got, a couple, uh, got a couple of Aussies on the roster. Yeah. Joe Ingles re-signed and, uh, and, and hopefully Dante has a breakout year this yep. year. So but I'd love to interact with anybody who has um, any questions on, you know, either LinkedIn or, or, uh, or Twitter, um, happy to have a conversation about sports or, or talk shop in general. So, Thank you very much for coming on the podcast. Yep, absolutely. Thanks for the invite. Sign up for Sports Geek News at sportsgeekhq.com slash sign up now. Thanks again to Spencer Horner, uh, who is now post interview joined uh, the sports biz slack community so please join spencer and myself uh, ask him a few questions i did actually ask the channel if they had any questions and they actually inundated me throughout the interview so i didn't get to a lot of the questions we did cover some of the ground so i'm sure spencer will jump in there and answer a few of those questions as well um, just go to sportsgeekhq.com slash slack um, i did promise in the previous episode a bit more of a recap from Seat Atlanta um, and sort of go through some of the panels that I really did like, um, including the ones that we mentioned uh, in the interview today uh, with uh, with Spencer. Obviously, the esports panels with Tom Halls and Charlie Shin. Tom diving in uh, into into esports post his career at uh, Formula E when he sort of got a taste of taste of it. Is now doing a lot of work in esports and is one of the leaders in the space. Um, and terrific to have Charlie's point of view from their partnership with MLS and uh, Seat Rookie uh, and former podcast guest Brian Costello did a terrific job moderating that panel and it was really interesting hearing uh, uh, from Robert and I'm going to I'm going to muck up some names here but Robert I'm going to say Occolini 
Um, but I'm, I know him as AKA Bump on Twitter from the Turner, Turner Sports Group and, and running E-League and sort of what Turner are doing in the, uh, in the e-sports space. Um, so I thought that was really, uh, really interesting. Um, and it was just a good discussion around where esports is headed and how sports can leverage it. Um, I absolutely loved the uh, innovation panel led by Jack Elkins, uh, again a former guest, and I, I really should touch base to uh, check in with what Jack's doing. He's always doing exciting things. Um, but he had a really great panel where he had Daniel, Daniel Brew or uh, from the Warriors um, talking about some of the initiatives that they're doing around the new stadium and how the technology is going to affect the the fan experience and I really enjoyed Janet Smirka from the Mall of America so the Mall of America has so many people going through and has so much so many uh, uh, downloads and people using the Wi-Fi um, but you know they're still looking at that customer experience how can they make it uh, make it better and there was some really good insights from on that panel as well from uh, from Mia White from her time at uh, the Red Bulls and in, in her Short stint so far. She's just recently moved over to the Miami Heat. So really enjoyed those sessions. Um, absolutely top-notch. Terrific work by the, by the moderators, but the panel uh, really delivered. Um, and, and for this episode, there's got to be a special shout-out uh, to the one and only Mr Chip Foley. Um, he did a really good job uh, despite technical difficulties uh, with the welcome address, uh, Chip now knows how difficult that is. As someone who's done it myself, uh, with no voice, it can be hard. Um, but I was really pleased and really, uh, uh, was, uh, I thought they did a terrific job, the guys at Amp Think, with the uh, Friends of Chip Foley uh, campaign that they ran on the uh, on the Monday night. Um, I definitely put myself in the camp of Friends of Chip Foley, and uh, yeah, so well done to to Amp Think, and I look forward to catching up with Chip when he's next in Melbourne, but it is it is really lucky that we live in different hemispheres because I think the world would spin off its axis if uh, if Chip and I were, were in the same town too often. Um, but, yeah, I always love hanging out with Chip. And one of the highlights, sort of post-seat, um, on the day, day after seat uh, ended, uh, I was lucky enough with Daniel uh, from the Warriors uh, to get a bit of a tour of uh, the NBA studio, studios uh, at Turner. And uh, especially for me, uh, as a long-time listener, and fan of the of the starters, uh, I was able to get the uh, go into the set, get a few photos, got a photo on the set. Um, I was able to sit in Lee Ellis's seat, former podcast guest, and chat with the guys behind the scenes. Um, so, yeah, but occasionally there are things that make me a bit of a fanboy, and hanging out and checking out the starter set is one of those. Um, I really, really do appreciate one what they do, but also. Uh, the journey that they've, those guys have gone on to, to get the success that they're, that they're having. They're doing a terrific, uh, terrific job. So last but not least um, uh, is a bit of a shout-out to, to Lenny and Darshan and the guys at Tradable Bits. Uh, they did a terrific panel uh, with Eric Klein um, talking about how music festivals and, uh, are activating and, as I sort of said there within the conversation with Spencer, uh, integrating their website with Spotify Login has been a... Was one of the really big, one of the really big takeaways of of uh, seat for me, and so we're going to be pulling some of that some of that info and some of those some of those tactics into what we do around sports geek campaigns. Um, so we're going to be pulling together those best practice campaigns from the music industry and how they can be applied to sports. As you know, I've used the phrase "steal with pride." We'll be doing that, making those tweaks. Um, to help your sponsorship t- sponsorship team and partnership team sell more sell more campaigns and sell more digital campaigns with confidence. I think that's the key thing. Um, until next episode, stay tuned to the end of this. Uh, I have got the uh, your welcome clip from my visit to the LA Galaxy, uh, the game that I went to in uh, 2015 uh, that we discussed with Spencer Horner. Horner uh, it is one of the best integrations. It's not even integration. It's completely organic, but the fact that the the, it was effectively left hand and right hand that they're in tune with the with the ground announcer. It's absolutely perfect. So stay tuned to the end of that. Um, and thanks again to Spencer Horner for coming on. Until next episode, my name is Sean Callanan, and you've been listening to the Sports Geek Podcast. Join over 1,000 sports business executives in Sports Biz Slack. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash slack. Please leave a review on iTunes. Go to sportsgeekhq.com slash iTunes. 
Find out how to drive between eight and thirty thousand in profit for each digital campaign you sell sponsors. Check out sportsgeekcampaigns.com. Just like Jimmy Butler, you can call Sean anytime at 61 407 0407 200.